The doctrine of sufficiency of Scripture is one of the most neglected and underappreciated doctrines in the Protestant Reformation. Now, the sufficiency of Scripture represents the application of the doctrine of sola scriptura. That is the belief that the Bible alone is the final authority in matters of faith and practice. In many ways, the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture represents the very heart of the Protestant Reformation. Now, historically, the doctrine of sufficiency is considered one of the four main attributes or four main characteristics of the Bible. And so, according to the Reformers, Scripture is regarded as authoritative, necessary, clear, and sufficient. Scripture is authoritative in that it is the final court of appeal in matters of faith and doctrine. Scripture is necessary because without it, we would not know the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture is clear in that the message of salvation can be understood by anyone who picks up this book and reads it, whether they're young or old, male or female, uneducated or not. All can understand the central message of this book. But for the purposes of our time together, we also realize that Scripture is sufficient in that no other source of information is needed for a saving knowledge of God other than the text of God's Word. And so, John Owen, our subject of our time together, very clearly states in a book titled The Reason of Faith, a book where he outlines the reasons for believing the Bible to be the Word of God, states the following, the things revealed in Scripture are sufficient to guide and direct all persons in the knowledge of their duty to God and all that's required of them in a way of faith and obedience. So, Scripture is sufficient to guide us in our relationship with God regarding what we should believe about God and also what duties God requires of us. So, we do not have to look to tradition or human experience or human ingenuity to know God savingly. Everything we need to know about loving God, trusting in God, fearing God, believing in God, worshiping God is recorded for us in sacred Scripture. Now, during the Reformation, discussions about the sufficiency of Scripture often centered on the question of the relationship between the Bible and tradition, or what is the ultimate authority in matters of faith and practice. And we see a consistent theme in all of the Reformed traditions. And so, for example, in the 39 Articles, in Article 6 from the Anglican Confession, it's titled, The Sufficiency of Holy Scripture. And the 39 Articles state, quote, the Holy Scriptures contain all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. All that's to say, the 39 Articles are affirming the sufficiency of Scripture for knowing God. Likewise, in Article 7 of the Belgic Confession, it has a whole section on the sufficiency of Scripture. It states, quote, we believe that these holy Scriptures fully contain the will of God, and that whatsoever man ought to believe unto salvation is sufficiently taught therein. The Belgic Confession, that is the confessional standard of the Dutch Reformed Church, affirms the Bible alone is sufficient 
for knowing God savingly. So you have the Anglican Confession, the Dutch Reformed Confession, and then finally the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 1 says, the whole counsel of God concerning all things necessary for God's glory, man's salvation, faith and life, is either expressly set down in Scripture or by good and necessary consequence may be deduced from Scripture, unto which nothing at any time is to be added, whether by new revelations of the Spirit or the traditions of men. Summarizing all of these confessional statements, we can say that everything we need to know God, everything we need to know about salvation, the Christian life, and the ministry of the gospel is either explicitly stated in the Bible or it can be deduced from faithful interpretation of the Bible. And so the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture is vital for our understanding the text of God's Word. And so when you move from the 16th to the 17th century, from the Reformation to the post-Reformation, we learn that discussions about the sufficiency of Scripture not only relate to the question of authority and tradition, but also relate to the relationship of Scripture and biblical interpretation. So by the time you get to the 17th century, the real question is, how shall I interpret the Word of God? Right? If God's Word is inspired, if it's authoritative, if it's sufficient, how shall I, as a Christian, interpret the Bible? You see, the Reformation put God's Word in the hands of God's people. And so it immediately raises the question, how shall the people of God interpret this text? If this text is sufficient, what does it mean for an ordinary Christian to read God's Word faithfully? Right? The Bible isn't just for the professionals. It's not just for the pope or a bishop. It's not just for a theologian or for an academic. But all of God's Word is for all of God's people all of the time. And so when you put the Bible in the hands of God's people, how should they interpret it? And that's the question of the post-Reformation, and that's the question our main man, John Owen, spent his entire life discussing. Now, John Owen is probably not a household name today, but he was in the 17th century. John Owen was born in 1616. That is the year that William Shakespeare died. John Owen died in 1683, just before the glorious revolution in England when toleration is granted to nonconformists. So Owen lives right in the middle of the 17th century. It is the most tumultuous period of time in British history. He's living in a time where there are wars and rumors of wars. And over the course of his life as a theologian, he writes something like eight million words. Remarkable. And it was said you could go into the taverns of England and they were discussing right, the works of Dr. Owen. You could go into the halls of Parliament and they were discussing the works of Dr. Owen. You could go into the cottages and churches, and they were discussing the works of Dr. Owen. And so throughout his writing, as he's dealing with doctrinal treatises like communion with God, or pastoral treatises on the assurance of faith in Psalm 130, or dealing with questions of the mortification of sin, in all that he does, he's dealing with the question of the interpretation of Scripture. And so of those eight million words, two million words are devoted exclusively to a commentary on the book of Hebrews. Because for Owen, Scripture represents the foundation of dogmatics. It is the standard for Christian piety. 
and it is the authority in matters of controversy and polemic. Owen believed that the only way to apprehend the mind of God is to interpret the written Word of God. So, God has disclosed Himself in the text of Scripture, and therefore, if we want to know the mind of God, we must give ourself to this text. And so, in the year 1678, towards the end of his life, he writes a book titled, The Causes, Ways, and Means of Understanding the Mind of God. It was a hermeneutical manual, a little book detailing what it means to interpret the Word of God correctly. How do we rightly divide the Word of truth? If the Bible is the Word of God, how shall the people of God know God in His Word? What are the causes? What are the ways? What are the means of knowing the mind of God in Scripture? And so, all throughout his writing, Owen will often pause and ask the question, what are the ways and means for interpreting Scripture correctly? And I'll just give you one example from his commentary in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, where the writer is talking about the Word of God right, being sharper than any two-edged sword. And Owen enters into a discussion on what it means to interpret the Word of God, and he gives no less than eight ways and means for knowing the mind of God. Now, if you know anything about the Puritans, they love lists, right? You know, like 32 ways to commune with God the Father, right? 62 ways to commune with God the Son, right? 56 ways to commune with God, the Holy Spirit. You get the point. They love lists. So, in good Puritan fashion, let's think about eight ways and means for knowing the mind of God in the written Word of God. First, when we approach Scripture, Owen says we must do so with a humble frame of of spirit. If we're going to interpret God's Word correctly, we must do so with a heart of humility. All right, that's what the doctrine of sufficiency is all about. All right? The doctrine of sufficiency says you do not have the resources in yourself or in your family or in tradition to rely on to know God. If you need to know God, you have to rely upon His Word, right? You have to decentralize yourself and place yourself under the authority of the Word of God. So, we cannot come to Scripture above the Bible and impose our meaning on it, but we must come and humbly place ourselves under Scripture and have God's Word shape our thinking, our feeling, and our doing. We have to come to this text with a humble frame of spirit. And so, Owen says, quote, there is no grace that is either more useful unto our own souls or more acceptable to God than humility. Right? We often hear about the young, restless, and reformed movement, right? And we sometimes like to talk about RBC students as young, restless, and respectful, because we want our students to reflect the character of Christ. We want our students to reflect a spirit of humility, of teachability, we come and sit at the feet of an infinite God, and we long to learn more about Him. We come to this text, and we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Second, when we come to the text of God's Word, we must approach the text with a heart of prayer, with a heart of prayer. 
The Bible is a divine book, supernaturally inspired by the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to interpret this text correctly, the Spirit of God who inspired these words must illumine our minds and our hearts that we might believe these words and obey these words. Biblical interpretation is a spiritual enterprise. We need God to know God. We need the Holy Spirit. Even Jesus tells the disciples, when I go and ascend into heaven at the right hand of my Father, I will give you my Spirit. And that Spirit is going to guard you from error and guide you in all truth. So the Spirit of God is given to direct us to the text that He inspires. And Owen is going to insist on the fact that we cannot know God, the Holy Spirit, apart from the Word that He inspires. It's this book that the Spirit of God uses to awaken us to the knowledge of God. And so every time we come to this text, we lean upon the Spirit and say, open up our eyes that we might behold wonderful things from your Word. We need the Spirit who inspired this text to illumine our minds and our hearts that we might embrace the truth of God in this text. So the Spirit guards us from error and guides us in truth. Third, Owen says, when we study God's Word, we must aim at the same ends of God in giving us the Word. That is, we have to focus on the divine intent of Scripture. When you open the Bible, you need to say, where is God in this text? This is God's Word for knowing God. Not puffing up our heads for knowing lots of information about God, but we come to this text with a heart of worship to commune with the living God so that by the Holy Spirit He brings us to Christ that we might know God as our Heavenly Father. And we come to this text to know and to love God as He shows Himself in His Word from beginning to end. You open the text and you say, what does God intend for me to know about Him in this text? Owen also says here, what does God intend or require of me in terms of faith and obedience? If I read a passage from the law, is this a passage that's teaching me to believe something about God? Or am I reading something that God is requiring me to do unto God? So I'm asking, where is God? What does God require of me? You open this book and you say, what guidance is given to me to face difficult trials and tribulations? Right, you read Romans 8. In those beautiful words, all things work together for good to those who love God and who are called according to His purposes. And then you ask the question, well, what is the good? Well, you keep reading in Romans 8, 28 to get to Romans 8, 29, and you realize the good is conformity into the likeness of Christ. It doesn't say that all things are good, but it says that all things work together for good, for conforming you into the image of God's Son. And so you open up this text for guidance as you undergo difficult providences. Owen says you come and you open this text in order to find comfort and hope. Don't you love how Paul says in Romans 15, that God has given us Scripture for our 
encouragement, for our endurance, for our hope. You know, you don't have to have a Ph.D. in hermeneutics to be able to open up the text of God's Word, read a text, and ask the question, where is the hope? Where is encouragement from God in this text? What is written in the past is written for your encouragement. And you realize as Christians, we do not have a dead hope and a dead Savior. The resurrection tells us we have a living hope and a living Savior. And so we come to this text in order to meet God, in order to have teaching regarding our faith and practice, regarding to have guidelines for difficult providences, comforts when we lose faith and are discouraged in the Christian life. And Owen says we open up this book and discover and discover the assurance of eternal life. There is assurance to be had of your standing before God. That if you're in Christ, you understand God has never rejected anyone who comes to Him by faith and repentance in His Son. God will never reject any who come to Him by faith and repentance, but He will reject all who reject His Son. And so you open up this book and you ask, What is the divine intent of this passage? That's number three. What is the divine intent? Number four, when you read Scripture, Owen says, quote, we must take care not to entertain lust in your own heart or mind. That is, you've got to deal with your sin when you open up this book. You can't stand at an arm's length away and just study this book like any other book. No, this book actually studies you. It exposes the sin that you're harboring and the depth of your own heart. So Owen will go on to say, well, you've got to take that sin to Christ before that sin takes over you. You kill sin before it kills you. Oh, friends, you don't let sin linger in your heart. But you bring it to Christ. You flee to Christ. You realize there is nothing too big for Christ. Right? Great is my sin, but greater still is my Savior. As another Puritan will say, there is more mercy in Jesus than sin in you. So why are you waiting? But you open up this text and you come to this text to wage war on your sin. Because we walk not in the flesh, but in the spirit, as Paul will say in Romans 8. why we often will pray as faculty for our students. We want our students to end their time at RBC with a greater love for Christ than when they came here with. We pray that for you, dear friends. This is not an academic conference. We want you to come here and deal with God in this text. We want you to know God in Scripture. And for some of you, that may mean confronting sin that you have been harboring that's unrepentant. See, what does it gain a man if he earns a theological theological degree and yet forfeits his soul? It's not enough just to know about God and His Word. You've got to know God. You've got to deal with your sin. You've got to go to the cross. You've got to grow in holiness and purity. So Owen is wanting us to deal with sin in our lives. Number five. Owen says, we must read the Word with, quote, sedulity and constancy. Don't you love that? Puritans use words that nobody else uses. In other words, here's the layman's guide. You need to read the Word frequently. What does Joshua say? Right? In the morning and in the evening, we meditate on God's Word day and night. 
Friends, we cannot know the mind of God if we do not frequent His Word. Are you spending time in God's Word? Do you love spending time with God in His Word? Do you frequent it? Oh, you may not read the Bible in one year. That's okay. But just lay open God's Word. Spend a month in the Gospel of John. Spend a year going through the Psalter. Right, right, take, take a chunk of the Bible and master the law, right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in one year. Make a study of the prophets to see how the prophets point to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah. Or focus on the Pauline epistles to get an understanding of the gospel of God. But, but frequent the text. Be fascinated with the text. L love the, the way that the New Testament moves from describing Jesus in the Gospels to, to looking at the ongoing work of Jesus in the book of Acts to, to then describing the, the doctrinal implications of the Gospels in the epistles to then raising our anticipation in the apocalypse for His return. Just fall in love with God's Word and frequent it and go to it in order to mine its depths because you understand when an infinite God inspires a Word, there are infinite opportunities to know God in this Word. Don't ever fall into the trap of thinking that you know everything there is to know about God in this Word. But go to the text. Frequent the text, meet with God in this text, and just develop a fascination with the text. The law, the prophets, the writings, the gospels, the epistles, the apocalypse. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because Jesus will say to those two men on the road to Emmaus, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms point to me. I think if I had a time machine and I could go anywhere in time, I think I would go back to the Emmaus Road to hear Jesus as the master expositor just open up Scripture and teach what it says about Him. Just develop a fascination with God's Word. Number six, we need to read the Word guided by what Owen calls the analogy of faith. The analogy of faith. Now, there are several hermeneutical tools that Owen will employ when he encourages us to go to the text. The first one is the analogy of faith. So, you understand no interpretation of a text can contradict the teaching of the Bible. Right? God is truth, and when He inspires His Word, it is true. And so, all 66 books cohere together to form one message. And so, we cannot interpret a text of the Bible in, say, Romans that contradicts another teaching of the Bible, say, the Genesis of humanity in Genesis 1 to 3. So, we understand the message of the Bible coheres, the analogy of faith. Then, a related tool is what Owen will call the analogy of Scripture. That is, no particular Scripture verse will contradict the interpretation of another Scripture verse. You've got promise in the Old Testament and fulfillment in the New. The analogy of faith, the analogy of Scripture. Then Owen will talk about what is often called the fundamentum scriptori, the foundation of Scripture. That is, Jesus is the starting point of revelation, that every promise points to Him. Every prophecy is about Him. So, He is the alpha point, the beginning of Scripture. 
And then the parallel to this is the scopus scriptori, the scope of Scripture. He is the fulfillment of every promise and prophecy. He is not only the beginning of God's Word, He is the end of God's Word. So that from beginning to end, in Genesis to Revelation, all of Scripture points to Christ. And so when you come to the text of God's Word, you need to utilize these ancient tools of biblical interpretation. You need to utilize the analogy of faith, the analogy of Scripture, the scope of Scripture, and the foundation of Scripture in Christ. You're doing a good job. We're almost home. Then Owen gives a seventh principle. He says, when we read Scripture, we must, quote, consider the nature of the discourse. That is, you need to know literary context. As the most basic principle in hermeneutics, context, context, context. So, there's a difference between reading an epistle by Paul in Romans and reading a piece of wisdom literature by Solomon in Proverbs. In our evening time with my family, right, we're reading through the Psalms, and you'll have to pray for my kids because, unfortunately, my kids get many lectures all the time. And we're actually talking about Hebrew parallelism, right, as we're going through the Psalms together. Why? Because Psalms are a piece of wisdom literature. And you have to read the Psalms differently than you read the Gospels. So when you come to the Old Testament, the Psalms and the Proverbs, you'll often see these parallel structures to the verses. You've got one teaching and another teaching below it. Oftentimes, that second line amplifies and extends the first line. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul, right? How, how is the Lord's law perfect? Well, it's perfect in a number of ways, but in one way it's perfect. It revives the soul in our relationship with God. The second line reinforces the first line. So you need to know how Hebrew literature works. When you read a parable, you understand there is one basic meaning of a parable where a spiritual truth is conveyed in a physical story. You understand basic literary context of the text. Know the discourse. Am I reading a gospel? Am I reading a historical narrative? Know what part of God's Word you're reading. Is it from the Old Testament or New Testament? Is John writing it? Is Peter writing it? Basic questions of biblical interpretation. And this leads Owen then to the final and eighth principle, and that is when we read Scripture, we must consider what he calls the grammatical sense of the text the literal sense of the text. You see, Scripture is not a wax nose. We cannot make it mean anything we want it to mean. But we've got to interpret the word in light of a verse, the verse in light of a chapter, right? the chapter in light of a book, the book in light of a section, right? the section in light of a testament, the testament in light of the canon, right? You're constantly interpreting a text in its grammatical context, in its historical context, in its redemptive context. So when you come to the text, you're actually pulling truth out of it. You're not imposing opinions into it. So Owen will say in his commentary on Hebrews, quote, Careful I have been to impose no meaning of my own or other men upon the text, nor to be imposed on by reasonings and pretenses and curiosities, 
but always going nakedly to the Word itself to learn humbly the mind of God in it and express it as He should enable me. Right? I'm going to this text to expound God's Word, to extrapolate truth from God's Word. But I'm not coming here to do eisegesis, but exegesis. Not putting my opinions in, but taking the truth of God's Word, bringing it out, and then giving it to God's people. All right, and that's what you're called to do. As you study the truth of God's Word, right, you meet with God, and then you help others. Right? Others see what you have gleaned from the text of Scripture. And so we give our attention to this grammatical sense of the text of Scripture. And so, the Protestant Reformation taught us a lot about the Bible. The Reformation taught us that the Bible, in the 66 books of the Old and New Testament, is the Word of God. It is holy, it is inspired, inerrant, infallible, and sufficient. It is sufficient. You see, as, our, as evangelicals, our problem is not that we have failed to defend the inerrancy of Scripture. Our problem is that we have neglected to heed the sufficiency of Scripture. One of the great ironies of evangelicalism is, in the 20th and 21st century, never before has access to the God's Word been so readily at hand. We have more Bibles than ever. We have more technology than ever. We have more scholarship than ever in the history of the world. More people can get access to the text of God's Word and understand it than ever before. So access to God's Word has gone the increased, and that's because we believe in the inerrancy of the Bible. But the irony is in the church, guess what? At the same time as access of the Bible is going up, our understanding of the Bible, right, biblical literacy, has gone down. We know less about the Bible than ever before. We have a problem in the sufficiency of Scripture, heeding it, knowing it. So, dear friends, the sufficiency of Scripture reminds us that God's Word is normative for the people of God in what we believe and how we live and who and how we worship and what we are commissioned to do and why we believe, believe live, worship, and serve. The Bible alone and not personal experience, not church tradition, not human ingenuity, is the final authority in matters of faith and practice regarding what we're to believe concerning God and what He requires of us. All of that we know. All of that we know. And if those things are true, then we must act on what we believe. We must heed the Word of God we uphold. And so as Owen taught us so many years ago, only the written Word of God is sufficient to lead us to know the mind of God revealed in Scripture. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We praise You that You have revealed Yourself to us in Scripture. We praise You for Your Holy Spirit who guides us in all truth. And so we pray for gospel-preaching churches around the globe that Your people would be built up in faith through the faithful exposition of God's Word. And so as we come to the text of Scripture, may we know You more fully and faithfully as we come by faith and as we trust in Christ alone for the redemption of our sins.
This we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.